listen to our weekly announcements. Good morning, SDC. And here are your announcements for the week. Don't forget that prayer meetings are happening every Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. here at the church. Pastoral care has been a bit challenging with COVID and the different restrictions. So, starting on Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the church office is open if you'd like to come in for prayer, chat. I still haven't met everyone in the church, so if you would just like to come in and get to know me, perhaps let me get to know you. There will be Christmas trees, and of course, there will be coffee as well. So you are more than welcome to come and join that anytime. This Christmas season, your whole church can come together, practice generosity, and offer the hope of Christ to a broken world. Poverty, war, natural disaster, these are some of the challenges that countries in the majority world face when it comes to sustainable access to food. Maintaining livestock is an empowering and dignifying means to strengthen families and indeed entire communities. Your support this Christmas will fill stables as you provide animals for families and communities through CBM's global partners. Animals like hens, pigs, or cows can provide milk, eggs, and protein not only feed families, but to be used as a source of income to help pay for school fees, medication, or other essentials. Your giving this Christmas is an empowering and dignifying form of support for the most vulnerable. To provide opportunities of hope and healing by buying animals this Christmas, you can go to philistable.hopefulgifts.ca and make a donation to your church's campaign. Thank you for giving hope this Christmas. We are excited for our Phyllis Stable project this year. If you would like to help us make this happen and donate, you can submit it to the church and just write it on your offering envelope, or you can go to the website phyllisstable.hopefulgifts.ca and join the Salisbury Baptist Church team on there. It's that time of year again for Christmas cards. There will be a basket on Sunday mornings you can bring your Christmas cards in and they will be all distributed. The last day to bring them in will be December 7th and you can bring them in during regular office hours or on Sunday mornings. This Saturday, December 4th, here at the church will be SBC's annual Christmas craft and bake sale. We are very excited. Come out and support us from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. Here are some updates for our Next Gen Ministries. Our ministry for grades 7 to 12 students is starting to meet in person once again. Blaze will be starting up in person from 6.30 p.m. until 8 p.m. here at the church. We'll be having four weeks of awesome Christmas activities and encouragement. Students 12 and up will need to bring their proof of vaccination documents on their visit night attending. Our ministry for grades 5 to 6 students is starting in person again as well. This coming Friday, Ignite will be starting in person from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. We're so excited to have our students back in our church for games, Bible time, and hanging out. Embers for kids in kindergarten to grade four will continue to engage with kids and families online via Facebook. Kindle Kids Church is still happening in person downstairs during our adult church service. All children are permitted to join us for music, games, activities, and Bible time. As per usual, the offering box is available before and after the service. We also have e-transfer available as an offering option. Send them to southburybaptistsea at gmail.com. Make the security question, what village is SBC located in? And the answer, Southbury. Or, if you'd like to automate your giving, we can sign you up for auto deposit. For more information, send an email to the church office and we can help set you up. That's all for today. God bless you and have a great week. Good morning again. Good morning. Jennifer and I will be bringing you our first week of Advent. Uh, our reading today is for the candle of hope. Uh, so our reading today comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 12 to 13. <clears throat> Advent is marked by a spirit of expectation, of anticipation, of preparation, and of longing. There is a hope for deliverance from the hurts of our hearts and the evils of the world, first expressed by Israelite slaves in Egypt 
as they cry out from their bitter oppression. It's the cry of those who have experienced the tyranny of injustice in a world under the curse of sin, and yet who have hope of deliverance by a God who has heard the cries of oppressed slaves and brought deliverance. It is the sound of prophets long ago declaring to all the coming of a Savior who would finally bring peace. It's that hope, however faint at times, and the same God, however distant he sometimes feels, which brings to the world the anticipation of a good king who will rule with truth and justice and righteousness over his people and his creation. It's that hope that once anticipated and now anticipates anew the reign of an anointed, anointed one, a Messiah, who will bring peace and justice and righteousness to the world. Today, we light the hope candle and draw our, our, our eyes to the anticipation that the Israelites had, that Mary and Joseph had, that John the Baptist had, that Peter, John, and Paul had. We draw our hearts and our minds to the hope of the world, Jesus Christ, his life on earth, his presence with us today, and his soon return all give us hope for a life spent with him both now and forever. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the hope of the world and the light of our lives. There is no darkness in you. You do not change. Jesus, we pray today that each of us would fix our eyes on you and follow your example. For the joy set before you, you endured the cross for us. May we take up our cross and follow you with your hope carrying us all the way. Your word is truth. Let us trust it. In your name, Jesus, amen. Uh, stand and join us as we continue to worship. Um, you might have had an opportunity to listen to this next song uh, if you checked our Facebook page this week. Uh, it's a new song. It's very lovely. You'll learn it quickly, so join us.
Well, good morning again. Welcome. Well, someone's awake anyways. It's nice to almost see everybody here this morning. We're just going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to have our speaker come up today. So let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness and that we can put our trust in you, God. We pray for our congregation and our needs today, for those who are grieving, for those who are going into this Christmas season mourning and grieving and not being able to celebrate. I pray that you bless them, Lord, and just pass your comfort onto them. I pray for Pastor John, Lord, that you would continue to work through him, and we are praying that you heal him. We know that you are the ultimate physician. Amen. And by your stripes, we are healed. So we are proclaiming that this morning, God. We pray a blessing over our tithes and offerings, that with it we worship you, we honor you, and that everything glorifies you, and everything we give goes back into your kingdom. I pray over the rest of our service, Lord, that you just bless us and open our hearts to all the worship, to the message, to everything that your presence brings here this morning. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to have our speaker, Chaplain Jonathan Gorham. Sorry, I'm a little stuttered today. And he's going to come up and bring us the message. Morning. 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 Great to be back with you and to share with you in the Word of God. Um, from what I understand, uh, last time I was here, that uh, the question out there amongst you as people was, who is this guy? Well, <laughs> um, I'm a no-name. Not really. Uh, but names are, are important. I have a name that I like to forget about but I would have been blessed with by uh, my parents. I'm named after three generations of United Empire Loyalists. Jonathan George Schubel. <laughs> Schubel was popular with Michael way back in the late 1700s, and they sent it my way. <laughs> well, uh, what I did with it, it's my email address, and it's coming back to bite me, because uh, people say, what? What is that name? Where did that word come from? Well, I have to be truthful, and so, anyway. But it's great to be back with you, to share in the Word of God. We've been talking about some keys to unlock the truths of the Word of God, and uh, there's wonderful strategies. There's topical strategies, there's an understanding that when you read Proverbs, uh, well, you have to stop and think about what the Word of God is saying. And uh, it is uh, challenging. But there's an understanding in Proverbs that there's uh, three keys. Three keys to gaining an understanding of the Word of God. And I believe that it's, uh, it's very, very helpful. Three C's, contrastive, and its key is the word but. There's completeth, and it is the word and or so. And thirdly, it's comparative. Better is the word that opens that door, better or than. And we've looked at the fact that in the Word of God, there, there's an understanding in the person's heart, Solomon, that uh, wisdom is incredibly important. Wisdom. And wisdom is the ability to handle life skillfully. Anybody here say, well, I don't need it. <laughs> we need, we are desperately in need of wisdom. In this confusing day and age when it 
seems to be that morals are unraveling and uh, ethics are, are very unstable and understanding that truth is sometimes hard to find. And yet there is this understanding in Proverbs that wisdom is a critical component of who we are as believers. Absolutely critical. The ability to handle life skillfully. You know, God's wisdom here described in Proverbs is, uh, is to be displayed in the way we live, not in what we say. We are different as believers. If we are in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there's absolutely no duplication of that out there. It's all God. He came your way. He came your way and changed your life. The ability to handle life skillfully. See, Spurgeon said, there is no fool so great as a knowing fool. <laughs> a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Have wisdom. And you and I sang about that this morning in the greatest event in the history of humankind. In a world of sin and darkness came a light as bright as day. Born in obscurity. And yet that one, Jesus Christ in baby flesh, flesh fully God, fully human, coming our way and changing the course of history. That's who we know. Another way to study Proverbs is look at a theme. <clears throat> and my friend, that is very helpful. Solomon unpacks for you and I in the Word of God an understanding that Hearts in a human being made in the image of God is critically important to who you are and how you live. In Proverbs, the Hebrew word for heart includes the motives, feelings, and desires, the will, the aims, the thoughts, and the intellect. A human being. Proverbs gives a detailed picture of the inner workings of the hearts. Solomon knew it well. Solomon knew it well in the life that he lived and uh, sometimes <laughs> his heart let him down big time. Big time. You find here in the Word of God in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 10, you find a wise heart in verse 8. A wise heart. The wise of, the wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will be ruined. I mean, it's very graphic. Here's that contrastive word that unlocks, that's the key that unlocks this truth. Wisdom. What is it? Say it with me. The ability to handle life skillfully. That's what we desperately need. We do. And we look over at a deceptive heart in chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verse 20. We find that understanding. The tongue of a righteous is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth 
little. In these beautiful nuggets of the truth of this God-breathed word, we gain understanding of how to skillfully handle life. In the Greek, the word for heart is cardia, from which we form such words as cardiology. One commentator who's been exhaustive in his, his study of, uh, of the Word of God, Gerard Kittle, says this, the heart is the center of the inner life of a person and the source or seat of all the forces and function of soul and spirit. This cardius, cardia stands for the whole of the inner being of a person in contrast to his external side. The heart is supremely, supremely the one center of a human being to which God turns. In which life is rooted, in which it determines moral conduct. What was said of David? He was a man, what? Beautiful. Beautiful. Did David ever flub up? Yes. Big time. Big time. And yet, in that failure, there was an understanding that a loving God came his way, revealed himself understandably to him, challenged him, and worked with him. That that one would say, against you and you only, God, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. David was saying, I'm that one. I am that man. But what did he ask for? Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. <laughs> what a loving God we serve. <coughs> what a loving God we serve. He is amazing. This morning, I would like to turn to Proverbs 28, 13. It uses the word but very clearly. And it's contrastive in nature. You get the contrast. It says very clearly here, the person who conceals their transgressions will not prosper. But the person who confesses and forsakes their sin will find compassion. I don't know about you, but here's a verse that sort of jumps out at me in an understanding, that's me, jumps out at what I experience in life and realize in this universal statement that God has brought forth in this verse. It's an understanding that it's all the human race and the person who covers their sin will not prosper. Will not prosper. But the one who confesses and forsakes their sin will find Compassion. The word conceal here, we're familiar with it. It means to throw a cloak over it. It means to cover it up. It means that that weaver shuttle frantically coming up with, with things to cover up what's going on in their heart, in their inner being, in their life. And my friend Christians, myself included, are great at 
and Shuttleworth. You hear it said and people going to church on the Lord's Day and you know if somebody asks you, how you doing? Oh, great. <laughs> we are great at putting masks on. We are great at covering up what's going on in our lives. We are. But it's ragged edge living. Ragged edge living. What if somebody said, when they came to the church, and they she said, Oh, how are you doing today? Instead of saying great saying, I am awful. Or I am so angry. Or I am I realize that I'm my, I'm not in a, a good place and I'm not in a good place with my, my children or my wife or my husband or someone else. Or there's there's this thing that I'm hooked on when I go on the computer that's that's wrong, and it's not, it's not helping. And it's not honoring God. What would you do? Say, well, better talk to the pastor. <laughs> we need to lean hard on each other. We need to find someone who will work with us and hold us accountable and encourage us. We need, desperately need those helpmates in our lives. My wife works for Universal Properties. <clears throat> and here's the Universal, there's a division of the Irving, and it's Universal Properties that look after properties. Here in this Universal Statement, every human being is included. Any and every situation of sin is noted. It's noted. The person who covers their sin will not prosper. They won't. But the person who confesses and forsakes their sin will find mercy and compassion. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that incredible? I remember a young man who came to Riverview. His name was Jason Young. I still follow him on Facebook. And uh, he was in the Westmoreland section of Dorchester. And uh, we as a church through Phil Ferris, we'd go down and have meals together, and uh, we would play softball, and it was a lot of fun. Jason was 6'4", broad-shouldered. His dad was a pastor. And he knew the depths of his fall. Killed a taxi driver in the Halifax area. But God came into his life and he realized the truth of the mercy and love of God. And it changed his life. Totally. The anger was dealt with. The sin was dealt with. There was deep confession. And he discovered the passion of the living God in Jesus Christ. I remember the first time he came to Riverview and shared in... Uh, in worship team that Phil had brought with him. And for some of the people in the congregation, it went right over their shoulders. I don't even think they heard what he said or realized. He talked about his sin openly. It's incredible. I remember Jason coming over to our house, and he was always watching his watch. And he was so cognizant of the fact that he needed to go back to that halfway house at a certain time, and if he was late, he'd be in serious trouble. But there was such joy in this man's heart. I talked to a parole officer about him. 
in the Tim Hortons on King Street, who had been a parole office for over 20 years, and he said to me, I can count on one hand the lives that I have witnessed being transformed. And he said, Jason Young, it's one. Amen. And I had the great privilege of walking through Jason as they attended Riverview, and uh, he met uh, a lady, and uh, they, were, they were married, and I had that wonderful privilege, and that man's heart has been changed. He's a gentle giant who has discovered in a deep, deep way that when you confess to the living God and you forsake that way, there is hope and there is life. Amen. Same way with David. Same way with David. When we understand of the truth of what was going on in his life, there is that understanding in Psalm 32 that life for David changed very quickly. Psalm 32. It's beautiful when God moves into the heart and life of an individual. There's a dramatic change. Notice what he says here in verse 3. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. My body wasted away. Through my groaning all day. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the ugliness, the guile of my sin. It doesn't matter where we turn. When you understand what true faith in the living God is, we understand there is a radical change. When God moves into the picture, our lives change because we have discovered something that is absolutely amazing. And it's His grace. His grace. What's one of the most popular hymns out there? Amazing grace. Ramp ceremonies. Remember stay ceremonies. Over and over and over again. That song is shared. I remember going up to Fredericton with the firefighters and I am a level two firefighter and also a chaplain at Riverview Firefighter, but I do critical incident with a lot of stations. But we had a 9-11 celebration in Fredericton and uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of firefighters there and police officers. And we were standing on the shore of, uh, of the St. John River in Fredericton you could see it, it coming Coming down the river was a huge, <laughs> huge uh, thunderstorm. And, uh, you know, firefighters shouldn't be concerned about getting wet, whether it's your dress uniform or your bunker gear. It really doesn't matter. Water's water. But anyway, as that storm rolled over, the lightning was massive, and it started. And finally, the, the parade officer said, we've got to get under cover. <laughs> Here they are standing there with some of these poles, metal at the top of it, in a thunderstorm. <laughs> so we ran across the street into one of the uh, uh, military buildings. And uh, we assembled in there in the bagpipers. And uh, the bagpipers uh, did Amazing Grace. And it resounded in that tall room. Huge 
huge ceilings. And then at one point, all the pipe bagpipers stopped except for one. And he played a verse of amazing grace. And it just literally, the Holy Spirit took hold of that. And I was hardly able to stand up with the full realization, just as John Newton, who defied God on the bow of a ship and said, strike them dead by lightning. A slave trader. But his life was changed forever. I don't bemoan the fact that Amazing Grace is sung all over the place at funerals, at ceremonies, and this, that, and anything. I look at it as an opportunity. You know why? Because God has gripped my heart with it, then I can go up to someone who doesn't even know Jesus Christ and say, you know that song? And they probably sing some of it to you. Or they'll hum it. But you know what I asked them? Do you know what grace means? Do you know who won that grace? God and Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be out there in real life, jagged as it is, and speak into life the truth of the living God. He that, or that person that covers their sin, will not prosper. But the person who confesses, what does confess mean? Well, it means to agree with God for one thing, sin. Your separation from the living God. That's what it is. The word but is one of my favorite words. Call it simple? Well, fine. We'll call it simple. Call me simple, whatever. Really doesn't matter. But when you look at the word but, even in Proverbs 28 and 13, you gain an incredible understanding of the love of God. Another beautiful portion of scripture that I would like to close with is Ephesians chapter 2. Here's a description of who we were, who we are. But you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. First word. First word in verse 4. But. But. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved through faith. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing richness of his grace. And kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves as the gift of God, not a result of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. My goodness, friend in Christ, if that isn't something that ignites in you a heart of joy, I don't know what will. I don't know what will, friend. Three of them. Three of them. And even in this day and age when they see all, see all these things 
that are happening to us and around us, the COVID and everything else, this is his world. This is his world. He'll never give up ownership of it. Our sovereign God knows of that last page that will turn in human history. And we need to keep on living. Keep on loving. Keep on realizing that there is joy to the world. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. When I studied in Israel at the Institute of Holy Land Studies, I met a man in the washroom. About 3.30 in the morning. And I was over there. It was in uh, June, July, and part of August. And Earl Tenney was there. Just a, uh, an individual who, who came to know Jesus Christ. Just a gentle heart, a wonderful writer. Uh, expositor of the Word of God, a theologian. I met him there. We had a fascinating talk in the washroom about <laughs> life. At that point in his life, he was, I believe, in his 70 years, 70 or 80, and yet he just exuded with, with, uh, with Jesus. Jesus. He was in love with Jesus. A few years later, I read the statement that he had made about that Beautiful I am saying, Jesus saying, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. That's emphatic. That's an unchangeable. That's truth. Here's what Tenney said about it in the book. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. That is all-encompassing. That is truth of that emphatic statement from the lips of Jesus that there's no other way. There's no other truth. There's no other life. My friend in Jesus, I hope and pray that even though you may be limited in this, that, and the other thing, <laughs> And it is cramped lifestyle and dealing with COVID and everything else, but wow. I hope and pray for you and I that this Christmas that is upon us, if the Lord carries, that we will go out of our way to share the truth. Amen. Of the living God. Of that by God. I love that verse in Ephesians 2.10 saying, we are his workmanship. <laughs> As I mentioned before, I've been good friends with Pastor Gordon McLeod for years and years. Just retired. And I remember going to Gordon College with them. We, we just became brothers. <laughs> and then Gordon had that saying, my sonny boy, <laughs> you're some piece of work. <laughs> well, I can say to you individually in Jesus, you are some piece of work. And that will never change because it's God at work in you. Amen. And you are his workmanship. And he loves you. And he cares for you. Amen. But don't play games with him. Been there, done that, paid the price. You won't prosper. We have a God who will keep on loving. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> what a God we know. Serve. I close with this. 
I remember a farmer in Carroll County by the name of Beecher Clark. Any Beechers here today? <laughs> Something like Shubo. <laughs> Beecher was a potato farmer. Farmed all his life in Carroll County. Beecher and I, Clark. He never made children. I was a young pastor. And Beecher was, there was just something about him that was, that was so common, so worthy. And a uh, quiet man. He would come to church and the, he would sing, but he was reluctantly. And, you know, he came to prayer meetings. He wouldn't say a whole lot. But I remember the last few hours in his life, in his home, <clears throat> his body racked with pain. His wife called me up and said, please come now. I went down. And Beecher, in labored, labored breath, said to me, I belong to Jesus. I'm going to be with him pretty soon. And I put my hand in his hand. Now his hand, even though his body was wracked with cancer, he grabbed hold of my hand, and it was a farmer's hand. And he squeezed that hand so hard, it hurt. Massive hands on him, and he wouldn't let go. I encouraged him, he encouraged me, and he let go of his grip. A couple hours later, what he shared with me became reality. All wrapped up in me. One name. Jesus. Jesus. Mm. That's who we are, friend. Mm. Talked about shouting it. Talked about sharing it in the worship. Mm. It's ignited my heart to be all that Jesus want me to be today, tomorrow, and the next day. For my friend, there is that song that says, for as long as there is life, and one breath left in me, there will always be one more song for you. We're going to share, I believe, in a song that's pertinent to that very Come, let us adore him. Thank you so much. God bless you. Mm. Love you in the Lord. Mm. <coughs> Stephen, join us as we close in worship this morning.
God's people said. Amen. 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 We've been challenged today, folks, yeah. to share the truth. We have the truth. And we are objects of His mercy and His grace. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And you know, He alone is worthy of our praise. And I thank Him for that. Thank the worship team for a great job. Yeah. I'd also like to thank all those responsible for our decorations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great job. Yeah. I thank the, uh, the hot chocolate crew up there for <laughs> warming our innards. Jonathan, God bless you for challenging us. We've, we have appreciated the ministry of this. So let's close. Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, we ask that we will go out empowered by your Spirit to share the good news, to share that truth with those that we come in contact with. Just use this, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you. For we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Next week, Brother Rick is going to bring the message to us. So in prayer for Rick as he shares with us. God bless you. Go with God. Have a great week, folks. <laughs>